It is absolute pleasure for me and honor to introduce to my friends, Angela from Chicago. And I have to tell you that your article inspired so many people. You shared such an amazing message of love and hope that is so valuable in our times where so much hatred and unfortunately not a lot of hope. So I'm, I'm honored once again to introduce you as our own member of our family, or we can say rage, but it's really beyond that family of the Jewish people. Please share the story with us. My article talked about growing up with a white supremacist as a father. So my mother's Jewish and her whole line is Jewish, but she married my father and he was a self, self-acclaimed white supremacist and my grandfather was in the KKK. So suffice to say, it wasn't a good relationship. My mother's handicapped and she has spina bifida. And I think my father took advantage of that. He was a very dark man. So because of her handicap, she was an easy target. She wasn't allowed in their household until she was pregnant with me because then she had their blood inside her and it was no longer Jewish blood. That's how ridiculous um, they were. So they got a divorce when I was about one and a half and my dad disappeared, um, came back, made me change my last name to his, left, came back. And then I would say in my really informative years, he was abusive mentally, emotionally, spiritually, thank God not physically. Um, He crushed my Jewish identity He would treat me as though I was less than. Um, He had a girlfriend and her three children were better than me. Um, I didn't deserve three meals a day. He would feed me once a day and a scoop of ice cream. He would straighten my hair because only Jews have curly hair. So for 29 years, my hair was straight. Now it's curly. (laughs) Um, he did, he just did about everything you could possibly imagine as a person who's just so full of hate. Um, and I didn't deal with that well when I was younger. I, in my article, I express how I turned, um, into addiction. I turned into an alcoholic. Um, I made horrible decisions and that's not the case today. So I'm trying to sum this up. It's just there's just so much so when my great-grandma was alive um up until i was 12 we did all the jewish holidays and jewish things and we got together and we you know um hanukkah was one of my favorite holidays i had to celebrate christmas with him so i got double the presents which i thought was cool because i didn't know any better um but when she passed the judaism kind of went away so on one hand i'm being told Judaism's bad. And then on the other, we're not celebrating the Judaism. So my self-identity was just completely erased when I was little. Um, And then I grew up in a very secular neighborhood. Um, I was always one of three Jewish people inside that neighborhood. Um, So when you learn about stuff like the Holocaust, because that's all they teach for Jewish history, you know, I'd get the, the Hail Hitlers and I'm your number one Nazi friend written in my yearbook and just anything you, any anti-Semitic trope you can imagine I had as a young kid. So that's what turned um, into addiction. But when I turned 27, I decided it was time to get sober and to deal with my, my demons because I knew that I'm better than this. So I got sober. I started reconnecting with Judaism, which is just the magical part because that's what made me feel whole. Um, I went on birthright when I was 28. When I was 29, I signed up with Rage and I went with you to Israel. Um, now I'm a huge advocate for Israel and the Jewish people. Um, my journey, my Jewish journey started about three years ago. But now um, I'm part of um, Heirut, which is the part of the World Zionist Organization. I believe in Jewish self-determination in our homeland. Um, I'm a freelance journalist. I write all the time for Israeli National News now. I also have a blog on Times of Israel. Um, I'm a little involved in politics. I won't say which side because or whatever, because that's a little 
up in the air right now, but I, I, you know, it's a Jewish woman and I write about her and it's historic because both members um, that are running against each other are both Jewish. And that's the first time to ever happen in history. So I try to do anything that I can do, not only to empower, um, you know, alcoholics, but mostly Jewish people too. I've met a lot of people in the community who it's, they feel ashamed. Um, they feel shunned sometimes of being an alcoholic and, and I tell them, no, it's okay. Like there's so much light on the other side. It, life is just so beautiful and has given me so many gifts and Judaism in my path. Like I just never felt more whole than when I practice Judaism and I'm within the community. You know, I never done a Shabbat before until I went to rage, um, I celebrated Yom Kippur, but I didn't fast. I didn't know why Yom Kippur was Yom Kippur. And I started learning. I started um, studying. I started reading books. I started writing about it. I started caring. And I just got as involved as I could. And I just like to share my story because it gives hope to others. And right now we do have a lot of darkness and anti-Semitism is on the rise. And we're never going to get rid of anti-Semitism. Like that, that's not going to happen um until the messiah comes and may he come soon but you know what i mean so i try to dilute it and i try to empower people because these people they're sick they're very very sick and i grew up with that sickness and it doesn't make you less of a person you're a great person people should be proud to be jewish we've been around for thousands of years and here we are and they still can't get rid of us and if that's not an accomplishment, I don't know what is. So as you said, with all the darkness around, I just try to flicker a little light of hope, of love, of it's okay. Um, so that's just a little bit about my life. I don't know if you wanted me to explain more. I want, I want to thank you tremendously because she had just, you know, these few, few brief moments. I'm sure uh, there you can make a few Hollywood movies and write. Uh, probably, I want to ask you two points. Like point number one, when you were at, so to speak, your lowest point in terms of, probably it was abuse. You were abused by your father and your, your, your Jewish identity were crashed. What actually inspired you to stand up to who you are? So when I was at my lowest, um, you know, I was angry all the time. I was a little kid. I was angry. I was mad. Um, I second guessed myself every single turn. You know, I didn't know who I was. So I would always question like, is this okay to do? Is that okay to do? Do I look okay? Do I sound okay? Um, are people going to accept me? Are they gonna make fun of me? You know, it wasn't a good existence. When you're not happy with who you are in the inside, you're just not happy, you know, at all. You don't have a good perspective on life, a perspective on the world. If you're judging yourself, you're judging others. So that's why, you know, I think first and foremost, you have to take care of you and you have to learn who you are as a person before you can take care of the world. Um, and at my lowest, that was, that was never going to happen. I would hide my Judaism. You know, I always wear a star of David. Now, you know, I've got two on me. I'm, I'm always wearing a star of David. Um, but when I was younger, so I had one on when my great grandma died um, at the age of 12 to about 14 and people would make fun of me. You know, they would say nasty words to me and they'd make fun of me. And I'd have a few people stick up for me, but I just, I took it off. I would deny my Judaism. I didn't, I couldn't deal with it any longer. One more comment was make, it was going to make me burst because that's all I heard. So again, you know, when I turned 27, I put it right back on and I said, you know, enough's enough. This is who I am. I'm going to learn how to be proud of my heritage. So, you know, it was, it was tough. It was very, very tough. Was it because your mother or someone else who planted some seeds and they blossomed at a certain point? Like it was out of nowhere, like you turned 27 and that like, was a gift from above? Pretty much. I mean, my mother, she's Jewish, but, you know, they're more secular. Um, they don't go to temple. I don't, 
I have the best Torah in my family. You know what I mean? Like I'm the only one that studies it. It just, they're very assimilated, which is what happens um, in America. And I think that because people wanted to point out who I was so often, I was like, all right, if this is what I am, I'm going to learn what I am. I'm going to learn my heritage and I'm going to be proud of it. So yeah, it was a gift from above. This was just an inkling, like aching inside of my soul, like that I knew I had to do. And the second I started doing it, it was like, you know, my soul was just free. I set the flame, you know, and I, I just needed, I yearned for more and more. Now, my second question is basically part of the first Right. Um, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I'm very intimately also, um, I know a lot about addictions because involved yes. with many people, many families. And um, it's so amazingly powerful what you said, because many people struggle and they struggle for years and decades unsuccessfully. Yes. And people actually, I mean, this is very deadly. This is very, very, very deadly. So when you say, I overcame, uh, once again, well, we know AA, Alcoholic Anonymous program, where you need to acknowledge, I cannot manage it by myself. And then you need to acknowledge that there is a higher power <laughs> greater yes. than you. And then you need to learn how to rely upon that. There are many other very, yes. very important steps. And the last one actually sharing with others right. and, and serving your community and, and serving humanity. But right. still... Um, people say that um, any addiction is a, is a painkiller medicine. And, and very often, most spiritual people, the, the people that yearn for meaning, when they don't find, they, they turn to addiction. But the true, um, the true healing is actually spirituality, finding yourself, finding yes. your place in the world, yes. and then being happy with who you are and what you do. How would you uh, share with people, 99% of people that walk on the streets or 97%, this way or other way, they may not admit that they are, they are affected and hurt by addictions, either drug or alcohol or other forms of, of, of addictions, either personally or by friends or family members, everybody's in pain. So if you want to share with us, uh, and maybe someone will hear, what is the path that can empower a person to rise and stand up and succeed? Sure. So I'll go in a little um, more detail on how I got sober. So um, I was diagnosed with severe fibromyalgia um, around the age of 22, but I, I completely ignored it. And I said it was a made up disease. Um, and then again, when I was 26, I went back to the doctor. And then when I was 27, I think this was the magic um, that we, that you were wanting to know. So the magic was that I was getting terribly ill. Um, and I just had connected the dots that it was alcohol um, and that I needed to do something about it. So I tested the waters and, you know, I told my family, I'm like, if I can do 30 days sober, I'm not an alcoholic, right? So I did 33 and on the next day, it was a warm day and it was a patio and I went on the patio and I was drunk for the next two weeks. So I was like, okay, this is not good. I checked myself into rehab. Um, I actually left early because I felt like it was kind of like a degenerate sorority house and it just wasn't good for me mentally. Um, and they were worried about me because if you don't go there for the entire month they say you don't last but i knew that this was the path i had to be on so i started going to meetings um in chicago and i went every day sometimes twice a day they say do 90 and 90 and i did a lot of fellowshipping so the first summer i was sober i met a huge group of people my age and we did everything together we learned how to do everything sober like going to the movie theater and sitting through a movie and not drinking, which sounds absurd. But when you're in addiction, everything you have to do includes that addiction. So we did everything together. You know, I learned how to hang out at the beach and not drink and, and go to the movies and, and just be. So without that experience, like going to restaurants and eating and talking and having real conversations, 
when you're in addiction, you have a lot of surface level conversations and there's no deeper meaning. So learning how to get into the deeper meaning made me look inside myself to see who I was. Um, and I struggled so hard with the, the third step and giving it over to God or whoever God was. They just kept telling me, oh, you know, believe in something greater than yourself, whether it's the coffee cup or, or nature or, or whatever, just believe something is greater than you so that you're not playing God. And I had the most difficult time with that. And that stems from my past. So one day I woke up and I was at a hundred days and I was at a meeting and I, I was like, you know what? I can't handle this anymore. And I walked, I took the train straight to the bar that was near my house and there was two bartenders and I had my credit card out and they completely ignored me for 10 minutes. And I was like, screw this. And I walked out and then I walked two miles to the other bar where I knew the people bartending and I could have a good time. And in between, I texted every single person I could possibly imagine. I'm like, all right, screw it. Like, what do you want to do? Let's hang out. And I get to that bar. The bartender gives me a hug and hands me a glass of water, tells me to drink it, shoves me out, sends me right back to, right back to my meeting. That was my moment. That was like, they call it the God moment. That was my moment when I realized. So it's really difficult um, to get sober and not everyone has those moments, but once you do, it's magical. And that's when I decided, okay, let's look into who this God person is in my relationship. But without leaving my ego at the door and learning a new way of life and being open to it, it just wasn't going to happen. You know, you have to fellowship, you have to hang out with people, you have to find a sponsor. Um, it was also a little difficult for me because they're very Christian based. So I did all of, you know, the AA work, but then you get into the Judaism work and that's just so much more. It's so much more, you know, you have to face everything within you and you have to learn. And I think that's what made my life so amazing. I've, I've been sober. And instead of getting in trouble, I've been going on trips. I've been learning. I've been writing articles. People respect me. They want to hear me talk. You didn't want to hear me talk three years ago. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a, an intelligent person. I couldn't, you know, say two coherent sentences to you for the life of me. But here I am today. And it's not easy. Nothing about this is easy, but it's worth it. Angela, I'm, uh, I'm just sending you uh, from many of our viewers, they're uh, sending messages to me and they say, sure. Angela, we love you. So I want to tell you, we love you. We Thank really you. love you. you. You are such a role model. You're such, um, such an inspiration for all of us. Uh, we would love to hear you more. We really would love you to be a person maybe leading our efforts because so many people want to share. So many people want to write and their support for Jewish community in Israel as well. You're so articulate. You're so talented that um, I'm going to be calling you. And I, we would really want to hear you, um, I would say, like once a week. Okay, Angela. Okay, okay let's do it. <laughs> and and we would love to share your articles, okay, <laughs> on on our Rage web page or whatever it is. We really would love to hear you, and we want our community because we have at least six thousand alumni. We have six thousand people that all send our support, and we want to be with you. So, sure. My respect I'm... and love to you from all of us. Thank you. I mean, I only, I do this. Yes, it helps me. I mean, you know, anything that you do, you do to help you. There's, you know, but it helps others. And that's the most, that's the key. That's the most important part. You know, um, when you share your vulnerability and when you connect with someone, it becomes real. And then they connect with you and then they feel comfortable about sharing their lives. And then they start healing. I want to tell you, uh, I'm reading uh, messages, tears in my eyes. Amazing person. Angela, we love you. Thank you for sharing all this. Okay. Oh this, my God. Are, this are awesome. Okay. Amazing. These are just few, um, few messages. One, one person is actually asking who joined later on, who is speaking, just joined. Do you mind just introducing yourself once again, say your name and how we can find you online? 
and follow sure. you. Sure. So um, my name is Angela. Um, I have a, a decent following on Twitter. It's um, Ann, A-N, Jew, J-E-W, La. So it's Angela. Um, so you can follow me in there. I always post my articles. Um, I have a few up on Israeli National News, and then I have one up on uh, Times of Israel for the blog. I've got a couple coming, um, and I'm going to post them there. But yeah, for the first you know two to three weeks that I've been doing these articles, I mean, it's been a whirlwind. I've already got one exclusive interview with a congressional candidate. That blew my mind. We're now friends. I'm, I'm going to her election night party. That's crazy. Um, and then the next one was about, you know, rabbis and politics and being bullied and if they should even be talking about politics and just crazy. And, and if Jewish values are political values and you just, you go back and forth because that's, you know, the kind of world we're in. And, um, Thankfully, in my in my drunken stupor, I graduated college with a political science degree with an emphasis in public law. So I think this is definitely my field. Um, but yeah, I'm getting I'm getting out there right now on the internet, and it just all kind of started right away. So we'll be there. Follow me on Twitter for now. Do we have also presence on Facebook, or we should uh, follow you on Twitter? Um, follow me on Twitter right now. I'm gonna make a, a public page. I think we should have a page. And yes. also would love to maybe initiate together with you some kind of a rage presence and, and, people, and people around you. And also, uh, next time we're going to Israel, yes. we want you to be with us, okay? Please. Next trip, we want to have you. Please, please. <laughs> uh, uh, our warmest regards, of course, to, to Chicago, and it's a wonderful place. We want yes. to see you as well. And we would love to have you here in uh, New York. So next time you're yes. coming... We would love to have a meeting with our, you know, community and you yeah. as a guest speaker. Yes, I. That's another thing I want to start to do um, is guest speaking. So, so if you want to have me, we do. We'll we come. Do. I'll come. Definitely. We'll Definitely. We'll do, you know? So very soon, I hope a little bit this coronavirus situation yes. will, you know, fade away, and you're right. going to be our uh, very honored and our own, yeah. you know, part of the family speaker here at Rage. In New York. All the best to you. Thank you so much for sharing. All Thanks right. Thank you. We'll we, talk we soon. you all the best and, and you should stay safe, healthy, strong and share and, and empower and, and motivate and inspire people around you. Thank you so Thank much. You. All the best. You too. Thank you.